Well, hello, Paula, and thank you. Paula is our very first, second, sorry, guest on our new podcast, our podcast with no name at the moment, but hopefully within a week or so we'll have a name. And the podcast is all about communication, and we're looking at five themes. It was four, we've changed it to five because we wanted to be positive. So we're looking at accessibility plus usability plus diversion, diversion, plus devotion, (laughs) devotion to communication, in other words, plus determination really gives good communication. And Paula is, well, has many hats. So the hats that we we are hoping to hear about from Paula today is actually three of them. So Paula is a business coach. She has a great company called Boss Lady Skills. The second is Paula has a great virtual assistant company, and we are clients, so I'm speaking with a bit of bias here, and that is Beyond the Maze. And the third is Paula is a mum and a wife, a partner, a stepmum, a daughter, a cousin, sister, brother, you know, communication in all of those areas will have barriers if you don't take that step back and have a think about the words you use and your way to use them. So welcome, Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Oh, anytime. I love chatting to you. So Paula, for you, um, well, as I said, Paula, we are clients of Paula's with Beyond the Maze. So if we take it from, like, if we look at the different themes that we're talking about with communication, what are the barriers that you see regularly in every area of your of your life that can be simplified by just taking that step back, having a think, and maybe doing things differently? Yeah, so I think like in my space where I, where I lock, you know, I live, breathe, work in the neurodiverse space um i have a son with adhd a husband with adhd stepson um and i wouldn't mind betting my father would be adhd Mm -hmm. um based on what i see so um and of course with our um with our work you know with our clients we focus on that neurodiversity and helping our neurodivergent clients uh so communication is really really key there and i have to teach my team you know how to communicate with uh, clients in particular because especially with ADHD or uh, I guess any of the spectrum uh, there are different ways to communicate because the the processing uh, you know the way the brain processes information is different and me having trained as an ADHD coach I understand that so being able to communicate that with my team and then you know my team will come to me and go oh I don't really understand what that client wants and like let's work it back let's let's talk about what what their outcome needs to be and then work it back from there so you know that's that's I guess what needs to change I think a lot of people need to sort of understand that and know that you know neurodivergent or not everybody's brains process differently so I think it's just taking that step back and understanding that people think differently, people do things differently, and if they're not doing it or they're not understanding the way you're putting something across, for you to take a step back yourself and go, how do I rephrase that? Or if you do, you know, if it is in the neurodivergent space, how do you um, restructure that so you can make it uh, more understandable in what you're trying to get across? Actually, it's really interesting because obviously I'm a mum of two neurodivergent sons, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Mm. And I actually, looking back, think my grandfather also had it. I know my father-in-law, I'm pretty sure my father-in-law has aspects of it. And what are the differences that you would do all the time with your child that you maybe would never have thought of doing before to yeah. ensure the communication is uh, what you need it to be? Yeah, so I, first of all, I don't give him too much instructions all at once. Um, that was probably the biggest key that I had. And we do that, you know, for our clients. And 
And it sounds quite simple, but the thing is, you know, the, the ADHD brain just processes so quickly that if you're giving them all this information at once, it just can't, you know, just can't focus on all of that information. So giving them one step at a time, and you know, I had to really find that I did that very differently. Um, you know, because you'd say to a child in the morning, like, well, we're going to pass that now, but going back, you'd say to a child, all right, go get the uniform on, go get your shoes on, go brush your teeth and brush your hair, and let's get out the door. And for ADHD kids, that's like, whoa, that's just, what are you talking about? It all blends in together and they do nothing because it just goes into overwhelm. So I literally had to stop myself and say, all right, you need to go put your uniform on. When that was done, now you need to go put your shoes on. Now you need to go brush your teeth. So really stage it out. So yeah. then it gives that, it slows that kind of processing down to be able to understand the steps and what to do. So how have you taken that approach and applied it to your team and in your everyday work? I think I'd use it every day as a natural now because it's just something that, um, you know, I've got used to. I guess I had to retrain myself because I reckon maybe I'm a little bit ADHD. I haven't been tested, but could be. Um, so I've kind of just rushed into doing things as well. But if I take it back and step it back, even down to goal setting for the business, um, you know, I know my end goal and then we work it back with both and the team set goals as well. So we know the end goal and then we work it back over the business in what we're going to do week by week to get to that end goal. And again, that sounds quite simple, but we're all thinking ahead and we're all racing regardless of you know whether we're near a division or not. We've all got 10 million things going on in our head, especially if we're mums. Um, you know, and so to be able to break it down and go, right, well, this is what I'm doing this week, this is what I'm doing next week. And the team work like that as well. And then, of course, within that, we have tasks that I have to do each week and things like that that they're checking off your checklists and stuff like that. And that's that was going to be one of the questions I was going to ask. Well, what techniques do you use? Because I know for myself, I use tasks. I, I live with my task lists. Mm. My must-do todays, tomorrows, my weekly tasks, whatever it is. So you've incorporated that into your team. Yeah, absolutely. So we have we have a program called ClickUp and that program like lays out everything. So there's a process. Where, well, we're in the process of processing everything, mm -hmm. um, but there's a process for most things at the moment and it actually gives you a step-by-step, -step, uh, this is what you need to do first, this is what you need to do second, and that's all run in the ClickUp program just to make it, easy um, for everybody and hopefully reduces mistakes as well. What about with your digital content, with the way you communicate by email, um, anything in that method? Do you change your communication methods dependent on who the client is or how do you do that? Um, really, we find that you know, if we're emailing a client or, um, you know, we like, as I said before, everybody's busy. Um, so our brains are all taking in a lot of information anyway. So I guess because it's natural to us because we live in that divergent space and we work in a neurodivergent space that we're just treating all clients the same. So when we're sending an email or a message to somebody or, things like that like if it's a phone message we've got a processor a phone message where we actually put in you know who the client's name is uh the phone number and under that what they want so it's nice and straightforward the client can quickly look at it um, but then if we want to do we want to do more involved than just a phone message and we want to bring something up with a client then we'll go point one i just literally just sent an email like 10 minutes before this and I was like, right, I have these questions and query, I have these questions and updates for you. Point one, bang, point two, bang. So I guess we structure it like that for everybody and it just makes it clear and concise as well. And the interesting thing with that too, it probably makes it more accessible because it's mm. clear, because it's concise, because it's listed in order. Yeah. It's much more readable, do you find, and you're getting a better response from the clients? Oh, 100%. I was just about to say that. The response from the clients is better because 
you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I get an email from somebody and it's got point one, two, I will literally just go, here's my responses down below and I'll reply to that in red or or capital letters or something mm -hmm. and I'll actually address each point. So I find if it's not done like that, things get missed and then you might ask, you know, five different questions in a matter of two paragraphs and people will forget to answer those questions. But if it's in dot point, they'll go through each point one at a time and reply that way. So I find that definitely does make a big difference. Well, then taking on myself and my business partner with both of us being blind, what are the differences that you had to think about? Um, I think being... For us, you know, Vanessa, who looks after you, as you know, mm -hmm. um, we had a chat about, you know, how we can make it uh, easier. So we don't want to, we kind of, I guess, we'll probably do it for a lot of people, remove the fluff, as I say. Mm -hmm. You know, we just make it um, straightforward to the point so it's easy to manage. So if there's anything, you know, being translated for you, it's clear um in our writing so and that's kind of what we discussed just to make it easy yeah. for you and then of course work with you guys and talk to you guys about what works best for you and that is one thing that we've appreciated because you have come to us and said well how do you want it mm. and for us as the client that was a great question to be asked because yeah. you don't get asked that a lot mm. um and I know like as a daughter, people will hand paperwork to me regarding my mother's care. And I look at them and think, well, I actually can't read the paperwork. So mm -hmm. that is an issue. Well, for me, but in that neurodiverse world and with assignments, homework, all those things, I know as a mum, it caused me a lot of headaches. What yeah. about for you? Yeah, look, we're extremely lucky. The school my son goes to is very, very um, supportive and they have wonderful processes in place to support that. So he has a learning support teacher who he meets with um, regularly and goes through all those assignments and things that have been assigned to him to make sure he understands, you know, what is being asked of him and how to lay it out and they also, you know, they, they submit drafts all the time and all that sort of thing. So I guess we are really lucky in that respect and I don't really have a lot to do with it because the school mm -hmm. takes care of it, which is great. But before we did move to the school, it was it was harder because their support, it was there, but it wasn't as there as it is now. Um, but um, so it was kind of I had to break it down for him. So if he had a, like a, it was only in primary school, so it wasn't too bad. But if yeah. he had an assessment to do or assignment to do or something, we had to go through it and go, right, okay, let's just start with this point first. Let's work on that. Don't worry about the rest. We'll get to the rest next. So yeah. I had a bit more hands-on with that. Yeah, it, I found it quite interesting with my kids. Mind you, we're talking, my, my kids are all around 30 now, so we're talking mm. 15 years ago minimum. Yeah. The biggest thing that my kids really struggled with was when they were asked to write a story yes. because yeah. my kids could not write a story. Once I could get the teachers to understand that they couldn't write a story, I had the best response and that took a bit of communication and sitting mm -hmm. down and explaining why they couldn't just write a story because one of them has no imagination. To him, what he sees is it. So in the end, he used to write about the AFL game on the weekend right. and he wrote every play of yep. the game for the whole hundred and whatever it is minutes and the poor teacher would get this huge essay or whatever it was of every play. Akamanis kicked to this bloke and Akamanis did a somersault. Yeah. But it actually worked until the teachers <laughs> changed and then we kept having to go back to that point of, communication again and saying to the new teachers this is what it is and I'm hoping that that's gone now for the school kids today because it's such a much more common I don't like to use the word common yeah. but it's more known about it's probably a better yeah, way more, to put it I think it's more understood um, yeah the, the better word but um yeah look we found the same thing it was a couple of times you had to go back to the teacher and go look he 
you know, he just doesn't, he, he gets what you're trying to do, he's just doing it differently. Like, yeah. I think there was one instance and I had to take to the teacher and he had to draw something like a house with 10 windows or something like that. So he drew 10 houses with a window. Yeah. So the only result was still the same. He was still showing the understanding of 10, yeah. but it wasn't quite the way that he asked for. So I said to them, well, it's still kind of right because your end result, the outcome you wanted was to show the understanding of the number 10, and that's what he's given you. Yeah. So I just interpreted it differently. <laughs> and that's what it is, isn't it? Communication and what we're talking about is also all about perspective, people's yeah. perspective on it. and. If it's not, if people, people, if they think outside the square and, as you said, take that step back, gee, you learn some stuff, don't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's even in, like, I watch you run meetings and things and the confidence that you do it with, but the mm -hmm. ability that you have to get the message across plainly it is yeah. a great method because again that is breaking down a communication barrier right absolutely yeah. yeah and i think for me and for you know anyone in my situation even down to the tools that you're using so can you tell us a bit more about slack and how you found yeah. slack because that's actually quite an accessible tool mm, yeah it is um i don't remember how we found slack actually i think it was just Probably just a conversation I was having with other VAs or I came across it on a platform or something like mm -hmm. that. But, um, yeah, we find Slack really good and that's really how we communicate with a lot of our clients. And that's sort of, and that's how we, when I was saying before, if we send a phone message, we just send those three simple lines. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it easy for the client to go, oh, there's a message there. And, oh, okay, what is it? Oh, yeah, phone message, that's cool. That's what they wanted. I'll give them a call back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it is a really good tool, and there's so much more to Slack. Like we've only got a free version, so I think with the paid version, you'll get so much more out of it. But we don't need that. But yeah, you, know, you can. We put our videos in there, and it automatically transcribes it for us. And does it really? Uh, it does. Oh yeah, wow, that really, is it just comes up. So and this is the free version. So yeah, it really does. And then you know you can when you talk about accessibility, you can. Uh, well, I've got all my notifications turned off because there's just way too many of them, but mm -hmm. you can have them on to either pop up or um, have a sound when they come up. So there's all different ways you can work with Slack to get it to work for your um, for what you need out of it, really. Yeah, okay. With Slack and with the other tools that you use, do you are you able to change the background colours and things to cater for people with colour blindness or um other tools, you know, other issues like that, like acquired brain injuries where they have to be very like the the methods and the technologies, the tech the techniques, not the technologies, yeah. with the listing and things are great for people with cognitive impairments, neurodiverse, people like me with my vision impairment. Um, you know, it's very succinct, but Again, when you're looking at colour blindness, you're looking at, say, dyslexia, uh, tools like that, tools, impairments like that. Yeah. The tools that you use, have you tested to see how that goes? Have you text, tested text-to-speech and things like that with Slack? Um, I haven't. Um, hold on, text-to-speech with Slack. No, I don't think I have. No. Um, the background colours, I'm pretty sure you can do with Slack and a couple of the other tools that we've got. But yes. I think it's only like if you want to change it to the white background or the black background. I don't think there's anything beyond that. But, but that's all you need. Hmm. Really, that's all you need. So it's interesting. So even a tool like that that you're using still provides most of the accessibility you need. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I just find the whole thing interesting, to be honest. Well, okay, I'm passionate about it because that's yeah. what I love. But I just like the way if we can break down the communication barriers, yeah. if we can open it up to everyone, then everyone has a better chance, don't they? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And look, with um, as, a, as a VA, I'm obviously exploring the world of AI at the moment as well. Yeah. 
And there are so many things on AI that was going to make it a lot easier um, with accessibility, for sure. Like what? Can you give me some so, ideas? Because um, I haven't done much yet on AI. Yeah, so there's one. I'm actually talking about a couple tomorrow. I mean, um, there's one called um, so pictures and things like that. Um, there's one called uh, Mid Journey, which is actually used through the Discord platform. And you can literally put in there, you know, if you're looking for a particular picture. So I don't, I think Discord you can speak into. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But you can put in there, like, if you're looking for a particular picture that's got a horse in a paddock and it's a white horse in a lush green paddock or something, you could yeah. literally put in there, um, you know, Create me an image of a white horse in a lush green paddock um, with rolling hills or something like that. And within seconds, it'll give you that image. Um, and it's obviously most of it will be original and things like that. So there's those sorts of things. Um, I'm pretty sure this could you can sort of speak into. Mm. Um, there's also um, there's one where you can create a kind of oh, D, um, DID, it's called. Um, that one you can actually do, you definitely can do text-to-speech on that one and that will create even an avatar that will and it look, that avatar looks pretty human-like, it's a bit scary, uh, yeah. and they will act, they can actually, like, then you can put it on the website and talk through it all and all that sort of thing. So they're probably the two main ones I can think of right now off the top of my head. But, um, but, yeah, it's just opening a whole new world of different things. Yeah, it's crazy. That, it is. It's absolutely crazy. i got to admit, I cheat a bit because that's how I get my ideas for my blogs now. Yeah. And then I just change it and reword it to what I want it to say. But that's Ooh. always my starting point is I start with AI now. Yeah. Where do you see your business and your work with people in regards to digital accessibility in the future, in regards to, um, because as you said, you are in the neurodiverse field, what techniques and what are you going to be introducing in the future to make your business and your communication methods more accessible? Not that I think there's a lot you can do because your communication is great, the way you do it. Yeah, I think it's something that we're always working on and, you know, like our, our, our future plan is obviously to work with you guys and make us more accessible on our websites and other things that we do and programming for you and things like that. So it's definitely something that we're always sort of thinking about and every time, you know, we might have a new challenge thrown at us with another client um, to go, oh, we hadn't thought of that. So then we look at other ways to think about that I think AI is definitely going to make a difference for us in our business, for sure, which is why, you know, we're having fortnightly meetings around AI now and having a look at where we can make things uh, more accessible, more, you know, more us for better with our communication, which will come down to AI as well. So I think that's going to send us in a whole another direction, I feel. Uh, but definitely, you know, we, we want to be known, and I think we've got a fairly good reputation at the moment as, you know, being that um, neurodivergent understanding mm. um, or, you know, our, our practice has got that understanding of neurodiversity. So um, I think that's like, we're just working away at that and keeping chipping away and, and making us, because we do have people come to us and say, hey, you know, I've been told that you guys know how I work. <laughs> yes, we do. So just getting that reputation, building that up, and then if we can move into the other, you know, my, since I was a teenager, I've always had something to do in that disability space. So moving more and more into that space under the NDIS and, um, you know, any all those sorts of areas would be okay. is a bit of my passion. One other thing that I've been meaning to ask you, because I know you have people from other countries working for you as well as VAs. Yeah. How do you find the communication barriers there? Do you find there's, like with changes of wording, different meanings for the same word, what 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 do you find? How do you deal with it? What are the barriers? How do you deal with it? And what are some successful outcomes from that? Yeah, so we've definitely had to adapt there as well. So we've got two team members in the Philippines um and all our other members are here in Australia um but yeah there is definitely some uh you know 
I guess with Australian Aussie slang is a big hard one for them as well. And English is their second language. So we've just found that, you know, we have to slow down. We've got a couple of girls that book really fast. So when we have meetings, we're like, slow down. Even I have to bring myself to slow my work speech down sometimes so they can pick up on it. But what we did adapt to um, oh, probably a couple of years ago now is we did we do videos for them. So mm -hmm. rather than getting in a, call, a Zoom call and saying, this is what I want you to do and showing them everything we want them to do, where they only probably picked up maybe a quarter or a half of what we want them to do, we would do just a video now. So it saves our time because we can do that video there and then send it over to them and then they can just stop and start as they need to. Uh, to see what have, what needs to be done. And, of course, I mean, they've been working with me for three years now, I think it will be. Yeah. So, you know, they've they've learned in those three years as well, you know, how we like things done and all that. But, yeah, initially I think it's just adapting um, and watching their faces as well. <laughs> when you speak yeah. to them, you're like, yep, they clearly didn't get that word. <laughs> so then yeah. you, you don't say, oh, if I never say that, why did you understand what I just said? Um, I just kind of guide from their body language and go, hmm, I need to rephrase that myself, so I'll go and rephrase it. Actually, that's an interesting one because the video was not one I had thought of. That's a really good technique. Yeah. And it's yeah. such a simple one, isn't it? It's a simple yeah. thing to do, and it would save you a lot of time, do you think, in oh, the long term? 100%. Because, and we do that basically across the board for our whole team, not just the offshore team. Mm -hmm. uh, we always say, you know, if you want to show somebody how to do it, record it because they can then take their time to watch it. They get, you, you're always there for questions anyway, um, but it's more about them taking time because they might have a video on one screen and they're actually doing a job on the other. And they can stop that, go do the job, go back to the next point. Uh, so it, it is a really good concept and it saves so much time. What advice could you give other business owners that are looking at doing what you're doing and breaking down the communication barriers? Yeah, I think just um, definitely, well, as I was just saying, video, yeah. <laughs> video things, uh, because that makes it easy. But uh, also like just like making things simple. And yeah. for anyone, I just think because, you know, if we just do it in it, things in dot point, there's a less, there's less things that will get confusing, um, less misinterpretation of things and uh, just easier for people to follow. Excellent. Thanks, Paula. Thanks so much for your time. I okay. can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And thank you for all, everything that you do do for us on a daily basis, you and the wonderful Vanessa. So thank you. Not a problem at all. Our pleasure.